Uh, Kelvin. So I, I met Kelvin when I was curating uh, TEDx Singapore last year. I met his son first. And uh, so the one thing that struck me about Kelvin is what a great father he is. You know, he really allows his, his children to explore their interests. And he doesn't want to do a lot of uh, what uh, Asian parents do, like dictate what the kids should be studying, what they should be exploring. And, uh, and then I found out that he has all this background doing lots of stuff in the creative industry. Um, and he very uh, openly shared his uh, O-level results slip uh, on Facebook, which is awesome. Uh, but anyway, I won't reveal too much. I will let Kelvin share his own story. Kelvin, everyone. Um, hi. So that's a picture of me drawn by my son. He just drew one of me with breasts and uh, in a um, ballet tutu outfit. Okay. So this is the measure of respect I get at home. Um, so I'm a um, Singapore product, kind of born and bred here. Um, my first fuck up was uh, there, there's a young boy riding on my tri trusty tricycle. I saw a uh, TV program where there was this um, uh, autonomous, well not autonomous, this vehicle that could climb upstairs. So I tried it with my tricycle and then I rode down, uh, cut my teeth, cut my lips. So that was the first lesson. Uh, as with every lesson, the, the thing I learned from it was the first person to me was my grandmother, and I still remember the taste of, of course, blood, but then the first thing she'll do is dab a finger of sugar to cover the taste of blood. So I'm like, ah, very interesting. Uh, and this was me living in a kampong, and um, uh, Fakap was following ducks, and then he followed the ducks, and I went missing for a few hours, and the whole village came to look for me. <laughs> and they found me in a stream playing with the ducks and the pigs and stuff like that. Um, but... All of that was wonderful, and, and I had a great childhood where you played. Uh, I learned a lot on, a lot on my own. There was not the internet then in the... I was born in 1967, so I'm 49 this year. So um, there was not the internet, so you learned a lot. And at, I think at around age 10, I learned how an electric motor works. I stripped it apart, then I figured it out. I did quite well in school, then I got bored. They obviously didn't do well in school. Then by the time I did my O-levels, I had two O-level papers. So the funny thing was in O-level, I was tested on how does an electric motor work, by which time I had lost complete interest. Uh, a lot of it was I was in the brass band, spending a lot of time playing uh, sex. Uh, I was playing a saxophone for 10 years, thinking that would make me more attractive to uh, the girls in class and school. Didn't always work out. But... One of the things that I learned from brass band was we kept singing this song, Stand Up and Fight. It was an old English kind of uh, ditty, but there was a lot of values in there, and, and we learned to fight in competition. We did very well in the band, but I did terribly, terribly at school, and my mom's a school teacher as well, so she went, oh my God. <laughs> so the choice was to repeat or to go to college, and I went to private college, Stanford College, where my classmates, where I first went into uh, there was a girl who had gone to jail because she stabbed her boyfriend. <laughs> so, so we talked to her and then she goes like, yeah, I'm out on probation. Then she shows us her handbag and there's a knife in there. I go, why do you still carry it? I say, yeah, so uh, if I get caught carrying a knife, I'll go back in. So why do you carry the knife? I say, oh, then, I, then she was clever. She goes, I brought oranges. So if I get caught, they go, I have to peel the oranges. with." So you learn things. I, I know those were my classmates. And then... <laughs> I have a very good friend, uh, 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 Havinder Singh, and the first day we met him, he goes like, we are very racist. Uh, well, we were all good friends, so we could be... The mark of togetherness is when you can insult each other, you know? At the worst, vilest, racist kind of insults. So, you know, uh, you know, then he'll take us to the... The first day in class, he'll take us to the toilet, and then he goes, hey, Chinaman, come, Chinaman. Okay. Everyone to him was Chinaman. So anyway, oh, we had no names. Chinaman, Chinaman, Chinaman. You all look the same, Chinaman. Come on. So he brought a bottle of whiskey, and then we all drank, and then we went to class and we were drunk. So I didn't do well in, in my A-levels. So badly, I had to repeat. Uh, I went to army, and then came out, I repeated. Oh, my kids are there. They're, they're here to... They've heard this story before. They're here to embarrass me. Okay, so then this was me in the army. Um... And my fuck up in the army was, 
uh, I did my three months basic military training and then I did quite well, I don't know why. And then they go, oh, you're up for officer's cadet course. And I go, oh my God, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so on the final summary exercise where you are platoon commander and they want, I, I feign migraine, I feign everything, you know. So I dropped out from it. Then, I think, yeah. then they go, okay. So I was hoping to be something like administrative clerk, you know, sit in an air-conditioned tent or <laughs> signaler or something like that. And I was like, so they sent me into a uh, uh, non-commissioned NCO course, right, to become a sergeant, you know. And I was put on course for one year, eight months. I went to combat engineers. I went to amphibious bridging combat engineers. I went to specialized training. I went to all of that. In the end, I was on course for one year, eight months, when the office course, officer's course would have only been a year. So I fucked up. You know, I should have just been an officer. <laughs> But the lesson I learned from the army was uh, there were a lot of people who didn't like the army, I agree. And there were a lot of people who uh, liked it. So for, for me, uh, the lesson I learned was I had no choice. If you have no choice, make the best of it. And I made the best of it. And I enjoyed myself. To I mean, could I have spent better? Yeah, it's all moot now. We don't know. But I enjoyed the two and a half years. We screwed up all the time. We screwed up. We, we get detained and all, and then we'll, and we're detained for the weekend, we'll go out fishing, and then we'll cook curry and stuff, like that, and then get detained another weekend. But <laughs> Okay, so when I came out from the army, I had basically four levels, half an A level. So this was in 19, late 1980s in Singapore, where if you don't have a degree, you don't have a career. And my father was a uh, legal clerk in the government, civil servant. My mom was a teacher, so they were both civil servants. So they go, oh my God, you have to have a degree. So my father goes, you know, I'm going to mortgage the four-bedroom HDB flat in Bado and send you to Curtin University. And I was 21 years old where I go, I have to make a choice. Because should my parents go into debt to send me to university in Australia or not? And I was old enough to know that if I had gone to Australia, I wouldn't have come back with a degree. I would come back a father, I wouldn't come back with a degree. <laughs> so I said no. My dad didn't speak to me. I swear, she didn't speak to me for a while because he was like, you know, you've got no career. You know, you'll be a dropout. So I go, okay. So this is typically what I had to go through. I think a lot of Singaporeans had to go through because the system didn't take you through this. Where is your self-confidence? Where is your courage? Where is your critical thinking? Where is your self-belief? All of that got kind of weaned out through the system. And I had to rediscover it. So I worked as a uh, camera salesman. I worked as a fast food chef in Tampines Junior College. I worked, in, um, uh, I worked as a telemarketer trying to sell Southeast Asia traveler magazines to beauty parlors. On the, uh, on, on the line for $2 an hour. Um, and I worked in all these jobs. And you know it's not a long-term job, but you, it, it had, again, a bit like my army and the college, it had wonderful experiences. I worked as a camera salesman off here, Fulu Show Building. And I was developing photographs as well on the side. The, the business had that. So you, you, get all these pictures, <laughs> you get all these pictures of like couples, right? And they're in these like heart-shaped purple or red velvet bits, and then they're like, you know, all the, and then you're looking and they go, oh my God, you, you're laughing and developing, oh my God, right? And then you get assholes, you get assholes as well. I, I had this a guy, a uh, Singaporean guy, who came to me and then he was quite rude. He goes like, oh, you have to do these photos and how much is this camera? And So I was sitting there, I was telling him, then he goes like, yeah, I need to get it done, you know, I'm going to... Uh, where was he? Oh, I'm going to MIT to study, blah, blah, blah. You know what MIT is, right? So I was so fucked off with him. I go, yeah, I know. I'm going to Caltech to study uh, fluid dynamics. So he went, oh, you're Caltech? I go, yeah. Then he went like... <laughs> so you learn these things where you go like... Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter at the end. They, 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 they were like, you know, everyone's trying to show up. But I had to make a call. I go, what do I do? So I took stock of my abilities and I go, okay, I'm good in language, notably English. So in the 80s, early 90s, what was the choice? Be a stockbroker or go into journalism. So I 
wrote into Straits Times and Straits Times rejected me because they go, you have no degree, you cannot be a writer. So I wrote in everywhere. I went to interviews in advertising agencies. I did copy tests. I hardly knew anything, but I just did the test. And then there was a local agency that said, oh, that's very good. We'll call you in, six, uh, in about two months and we'll let you know. Right? A month later, I see the ads that I drew for the copy test on the buses. <laughs> okay? So I'm like, hmm. So I finally got a job in Ogilvy, uh, and, and instead of getting a writer's job, again, they said you needed to have a degree. They gave me a job in traffic. Traffic was so low down the packing order, um, dispatch riders would make me buy coffee for them. <laughs> okay, that's how low down. Um, but, you know, you worked your way up, and I worked my way up, and, and <laughs> that's the <laughs> glamorous advertising life, kind of, then. When you, and along the way in the career, you made a lot of uh, fuck up. So I had a boss who came to me, very good boss and still very good friends. He gave me my uh, first shot and I was doing like in my then job, three persons job. And then I was paid, when I first got the job, I was paid 500 a month. The second, when I was confirmed, they go, I confirm you for $600. I go, hang on, that's less. After, I'll be taking home for 450 after CPF. Then they go, yeah, take it or leave it. Then I talked to the HR manager, Doreen, who was such a nice lady. Then I saw she's a dog lover. Then I, you know, you look at my Dalmatians. They eat Ikenuba and I am. So it's quite costly. You know, 450, then I take away them, bus fare. I don't have very much. Then Doreen was so nice. Then she go, okay, I'll give you 800. I go, okay, thank you. <laughs> so you keep trying. Uh, same thing, and then, then each fuck up as you go, you become braver, right? So then my boss came in and said, okay, now you're on $1,200 a month. This was in 1992. Uh, and then he went, okay, now I'm giving you a pay raise to 1005 uh, You know, that's about 20% pay raise. I go, mm, not good enough, Robert. Then he goes, what do you mean not good enough? I go, not good enough. Then he goes, what's good enough? Then I, in my head, I go, 2800 then he goes, how do you arrive there? I go, like, I'm doing three percent job, so I'm giving you a discount, actually doubling the pay. <laughs> so he went like, mm, I don't think, you know, you're so young, first year, two years in the, uh, the business, and you ask for so much, you can't. So I said, oh, look, take care, leave it, Robert. Uh, I like you a lot, but, you know, I got so many people looking for me, you know, I have no jobs. <laughs> um, and, and Robert went back to his credit and said, look, I can't make the books balance yet, but for the next three months, you take your, this current salary. After that, I'll jack you up to two eight. But I can't put it on paper. You have to trust me. So I shook hands. I said, okay, I shook hands. I trust you. Okay, and then, okay, he didn't arrive three months. He actually arrived around five months. But I go, okay, you know, he, he was good. So each, each thing you keep pushing. Then as the career did better, I kept pushing. I quit the job to go to America without a job, and I went there to look for a job. At that stage, I was already creative director. I had been uh, ranked number one in Asia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, each, tape, each stage, you go, how can I fuck it up even more? And you go. And then you won't know until you try. That's the honest truth. And I, I did quite well in America. I got a job in the top three agency, uh, the most creative agency then as a creative director, like first Singapore. And then this happened. My dad had cancer. After he retired, three months later, he had stage four colon cancer. I was like, <sighs> so I sat down with my father and I go, I'm happy not to go. By which time he knew I had a legitimate career in advertising. When I first got into advertising, he thought I was a horse racing bookie. <laughs> because, you know, he, for him, he's a civil servant. How can you go to work in Bermudas? How come people page you at two o'clock in the morning to, you know, stuff like that? But he knew that. Then I go like, look, I have this job. Happy to give it up. I'll be here. Then he goes, no, you have to go. You have to go. And um, so the defining moment, the big fuck up year for me was 2002. He passed away yesterday, 14 years to the day. And I wrote this for him to clear up what I felt. You know, 10 years ago, I did scatter my father between Pulau Ubin. We were on a boat, bum boat. I held his ashes and we threw it. Uh, he gave up his education. 10 sisters and a brother looked after my, my uh, uh, grandparents, my mother's side, uh, the family. He was very cheerful. He sang when he was drunk and when he wasn't. 
Uh, and, you know, it was fucked up. He looked forward to his whole life of retirement, and then he's got terminal cancer. And despite that, asked me to go to America. So yeah, I had to deal with all these issues. He was a handful of men. I had to bury the quarrels that we had, and the kind that we all have, fathers and sons, we all have those quarrels. I buried myself in work. I buried myself until my family helped to dig me out. Because we all become our fathers. And maybe it's because we all bury our fathers deep within ourselves. So that was the thing that I learned and, and had to come to terms with. And also, as I parent, try not to do the same things that, you know, would end up here. But, so this was, this was a tough year for me. He passed away. Um, uh, two months later, uh, my son was conceived. Uh, uh, actually, a month after he passed away, my father-in-law had a quadruple bypass. We bought an apartment to <clears throat> in Singapore, so that was a bit tough uh, at the height of recession. But we bought an apartment. Moving is always very stressful. Stressful. Um, we started. I started the American agency here in in Asia in 2002 at the height of SARS and the. Um, economic recession in 9-11. So there was a lot of stress. End of the year, after my son was born in December, uh, I'm not feeling too good. Went to the doctor. Doctor said, oh, you, you, something's not right. So I had to have an ECG. And the ECG came out and the doctor says, you're 33, 34-year-old man. One of your arteries is blocked. So I'm like, shit. <laughs> so I'm lying there having my angioplasty. Have you, have you had an so the tube's inserted through your thigh up here, and you're, you're lying there, and you're watching your heart beating in slow motion, and they inject iodine. And all the arteries were clear. So you go and see a Chinese doctor, a Chinese doctor go, young man, why you stress so much? <laughs> so 2002, I, I just thought, if I could survive that year, I could survive anything. Okay. And that, that was a turning point for me where, where, I mean, there were many fuck-ups along the way. One of the things I determined to do was I had to give talks. As I was giving talks, uh, and that, that was Dylan when he was six, I brought him up on stage. So to get him used to being on stage, uh, and then a couple of times he had a small little speaking role, then he became better. Because I, I thought then in 2007 and eight, I was talking about how uh, um, I was already then the, uh, what was my job then? I was the vice chairman and the chief creative officer for publicists in the Asia, in, throughout Asia, excluding uh, Australia. So uh, I had to go around and determine what the company's strategy and what the vision was. So I was pointing them towards what an exponential future we were living in, and we have to get ready. In thinking about it, I was thinking, he's going to school, getting ready for a job that either doesn't exist or will be obsolete by the time he comes out. So I better teach him what I thought, or in part at least the values that I think will be important and will prepare him for that. Presentation skills, I thought, would be important. So I took him on board, and we screwed up. I mean, I, did, I don't know whether you remember this. I, I think you do. We, did, we gave this talk. Failure is good. We misspelled failure. On top of that, <laughs> on top of that we wrote it in permanent ink. <laughs> So at the end of the talk, we tried to, like, mm, you didn't, okay, let's see. So we walked away from it. <laughs> so there was a lot of um, uh, screw-ups along the way, but we learned, and, and it was a learning journey for, for us. Uh, then I made the big decision to leave and quit my job. So from high-flying executive to, to farmer, so I was doing a lot of these things. So I traded, uh, uh, come, I had a company. Okay, I don't, 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 forgive me, but I had a company car. It happened to be a Maserati. So, I had a company car, <laughs> gave it all up, and now I'm driving a pickup truck. Okay? Now, the, the difference is felt when you are driving along the road, and the number of kind of, this I get from a, a pickup truck is more than from a Maserati, <laughs> surprisingly. And then now you drive in the hotels, in the past, the hotels were like, oh, park here. Thank you very much. You must park here. Now, when you drive in a pickup truck, they go, hey, look, eh, the, the loading bay is that way. Why you come here? <laughs> uh, one day, I went to visit my friend in Bukit Timah in his condo, and then they stopped me from going. And no, 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 no contractor. The contractor cannot come here. <laughs> no, no, cannot. 
so <laughs> a lot of people were, when I left that job in 2011, um, and I told my wife, look, give me two years. We'll figure something out. But two years, I want to spend more time with the kids uh, when they're still young and they want me. Uh, it's been five years, so I'm pushing it. <laughs> um, so uh, people were telling me in the industry, oh, you can't do that. If you do that, you'll be irrelevant. People will leave you. Oh, no, people will forget, but you won't get your career back, etc., etc." Et it was just one of those things where you had to make a plunge to go, like, screw it. Now, a lot of you might think, oh, that's easy because you're this high and then you give it up. But you don't forget, I started here, build it all the way up here, and then walk away. It's a real tough thing. For the, for the next six months, I was like, there was no income, what do I do? So uncomfortable because life has conditioned you to think that your money must go up and not go down. Okay? So we moved on. Uh, but it's been well. It's been good. So what have I up to now? Uh, we've got urban rooftop farm. We've been farming. We, we do 40% of our vegetable needs now. So the kids learn about farming and they understand nature. That's very important. They're connected to it. Uh, on the right here, this is the house. It's an old house that was passed on to my grandmother and to my mother. So the choice was she could sell it, go on holiday, find a new boyfriend, you know, and then, and she was all for it. She's 73, but she was like, ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> So I go, look, give me two years, I'll renovate it, and then uh, after we renovate it, let's do something. We're going to grow vegetables there, and then the question we ask is, what is the 21st century kampong in Singapore? Can we grow enough to sell to the neighbourhood? Can the old people come to cook their old recipes, and people come in, pay to eat those things? Can we think of a house as a content channel? Can we think of a house as a startup and incubator? Can the young chefs around Singapore who are finding it so difficult to start business come here and say, I'll give, you this, uh, I'll give you this kitchen for a week. Uh, this week, I'm harvesting radish. Think of a menu, build your profile, build your following. Can that all happen? It could all fuck up. It could all go tits up. I don't know. But I'm willing to try. Uh, wrote a book with my son. Uh, this was the big red dot. This was the thing he presented at TEDx. And, and he, he did quite well. Um, and then we're doing a, not to forget my daughter. They all have projects. Uh, my daughter has a capsule collection of dresses that she's designed, so she's going to get that out because that's her passion. So what I want the kids to understand is they're living in this exponentially changing world where if they have a passion, if they have an idea, if they have a thing they want to do, go do it, crowdfund, crowdsource, learn how to get it out. And then does it work? Did it work? If it fails, what have I learned? And then move on to the next thing. That's the real life experience that I want them to do. You know, school is school. School, they enjoy school because they enjoy playing. If you look at Dylan and, and you see his TEDx talk, it's so eloquent, but actually he's, he's barely scraping by. But it's okay. I set him the target. Try your best. Doesn't mean scrape by. Eh? Try your best. <laughs> you know? Uh, and then uh, in March, I'm, doing, I'm curating a convention, uh, ex, uh, convention called Future Me with all the new things that are happening in Singapore or around the region we're putting together at Marina Bay Sands. So all these things could work, may not work. At the end of it, what drives me is having become a father, I've learned the value of questioning, the way our kids question. And this was something I wrote when, di when Ava came back from school and she learned the Singapore Pledge. And she's not familiar with the Pledge, so she recited it with a question mark at the end of every line. And it actually goes... If you put a question mark at the end of everything, it makes you reconsider and think. It makes you go, I've been conditioning things this way, but what is it now? So that has been my attitude. I will continue to fuck up. There will be many more to come, but this is what I've learned from them. And I look forward to each and every fuck up that will come my way. Thank you very much. Questions? Two very quick questions. Mm. Sorry, yeah, I took a, a bit longer. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Ooh. Okay, what is it like to become a creative? Um, uh, people think that it's this special superpower. It's not. We're all latently creative. Somewhere along the line, you got, you, you got conditioned it out by, by the system. Uh, the th thing about kids is they think and believe anything can happen. 
it's the adults who go, no lie, are you sure not? No lie, don't be stupid. Daddy tried that before, it won't work. <laughs> so you kill it. But actually what the minds were very capable of thinking was taking two unconnected things and putting them together. And one of the things we're trying to experiment with the house that we're, uh, we have is to conduct creativity kind of classes for parents and children. So the parent must attend with the child. Cannot go and like send your maid to come in and then, no. <laughs> Because it's actually for the parent, not for the kid. <laughs> so we, we've conducted a couple of sessions with my children, and, and it's amazing. The kids are all like, oh, let's do this. But the parent, no, la, cannot. How can... How, okay, I'll give you an example. Dylan was doing his primary school PSLE exam, and he's, he did his composition. I go like, eh, this sucks, man. Huh? You can write better. Then goes, my teacher wants me to write logically. So I talked to the teacher. The teacher says, look, to score high at PSLE, we encourage the boys not to write about superheroes, talking animals, ghosts, <laughs> or blah, blah. So I go like, that's Harry Potter. That's the Marvel kind of franchise. That's everything they're reading. In it, blight everything. And you're telling them not to do it. Why? Then they go, oh, because we grade them on composition, grammar. And I go, you know, when he's 20, uh, his composition, his grammar might suck. But you can go, hey, can you take a semester in you know, English grammar? It's fine. If it's no longer creative, you can't go, hey, can you take a semester in creativity? It's gone. So it's a, it's a way of thinking and it's a sort of philosophy where the kids always, uh, when they're presented with a problem, they go, there's a way out of it. Maybe I combine these things. Maybe I... The ultimate goal for me is to raise children who are a bit like MacGyver. You present them with a problem, they go, I'll figure it out. Whereas our system goes, you have to follow the model answer. <laughs> And the model answer means someone will have discovered it first, not you. So that takes away your creativity and your self-confidence. Okay, with that. <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions you want to ask any of our speakers, please feel free to approach them. We can stay behind to have more drinks and mingle, um, you know, after this. Uh, just a very quick... Um, Reminder that uh